The following segment is sponsored by Xterra Incorporated, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol XAG.V. Xterra plans to become a mid-tier producer of silver and base metals through the development of its Bilbao deposit located in the central Mexican mineral belt in the state of Zacatecas, as well as through additional exploration and acquisition opportunities. Find Xterra on the web at xterra.ca. Join me for a conversation with a frequent guest of the show, David Morgan, the Silver Guru, an expert on money, metals, and mining, also a lecturer and an author. Mr. Morgan has written Get the Skinny on Silver Investing, available on Amazon.com. His website is TheMorganReport.com. David, welcome to the program. Well, it's good to be with you. Well, our looming, uh, impending budget crisis seems to be at least postponed for the time being, and the Chinese have decided to uh, downgrade our credit rating, or at least a Chinese agency. Do they foresee something that's coming that's not pleasurable? Yes, indeed. It seems that our credit rating agencies that kind of were uh, had some pressure on them to not downgrade U.S. debt, but the Chinese and through their own agencies said, you know what, these people are not being responsible and therefore they deserve a downgrade. And try to be objective, I think they're right. I mean, the situation is destruction of the currency. I mean, there's two ways to get out of this. One is the fall on the debt, which was all of the machinations that were going on up until recently, meaning that the debt limit wouldn't be raised, which we all knew it would be. But that's one way. He's still Paul said, nope, can't pay it. And the other way is to destroy the currency. So it gets paid, but it gets paid in a currency that becomes worthless over time. It's worth less and worth less and eventually gets to the point where you have a currency crisis or, as Jim Wickard says, a currency wars. But what basically takes place, as we've discussed many times, is that the currency gets shunned and people, entities, nation states, etc., from the bottom up, look for assets that hold their value, whether it's a jar of peanut butter, gold, silver, a business, a building, or whatever, something tangible that cannot be depreciated, at least the value is there by the very structure of it itself. So it is interesting times, as I like to say. Now, the Chinese have a bunch of our currency. They've collected it over the years in the form of buying our debt. And they also have an interest in boosting their own currency, and they've done everything they can to try and balance those two things out over the last few years in the hopes that our currency becomes, uh, what is the word, well, meaningless over time. How is this cakewalk working for them? How are they able to pull off both? Are they willing to risk uh, losing the equity they have with us? Well, I've thought about it a great deal. Here's my take. That amount of debt that the Chinese have bought, for the most part, has really been recycled a great deal. I mean, they've gone in, they've bought a lot of assets in the ground, mining situations, energy situations, some that they've been uh, turned back on. There was one in uh, area off their coast that was, for security reasons, the U.S. wouldn't let them have it. But anyway, the point being is that they have put a lot of that cash to work. And so they do have real assets even though they still hold a great deal of the debt. So in a scenario of a thought experiment only, let's be clear on this, but let's just say, poof, the bond market went to zero overnight. That's not going to happen, but let's just do that as a thought experiment. What did they get? Well, during the process of buying all of this debt, they really did use it to a great degree, again, to buy assets in the ground, energy, and to build infrastructure in their own country. So it's not like they just sat there and held it, not saying that it isn't on their balance sheet, it is, but what I'm implying or suggesting to consider is that a lot of that money has gone to expand their economic base in a significant way and, as we see as, you know, putting on my Austrian hat, a great deal of misallocation of capital, as we've talked about before on your show, is, you know, they have these massive real estate projects that are basically ghost towns that haven't really been populated because of price, location, whatever, people can't afford them for the most part. So a lot of it has gone into the economy. So I look at it like if everything collapsed, did they get the use of that money? And I would say objectively, yeah. They maybe didn't use it all, but they did use a great deal of it. The problem is how do you get rid of you know the rest of it or whatever? And the answer is you may not be able to. I mean, once the bond bubble is pierced, and I think it has been, then you've got to be careful how you get out of the market because you don't want to split 
the market, like any market. I mean, if you have a great big position in a certain stock and you hold, let's say, 5 or 10% of that given stock, you cannot dump that whole amount on the market or you drive the price down significantly. And, of course, going off on a tangent here, that's what happens in the gold and silver market from time to time. I mean, there's these massive positions that are sold in one keystroke, and, of course, it drives the price down. Well, the same thing would happen in any market. So you have to be careful to sell it slowly over time and not make waves, so to speak. Well, the same thing, of course, in the bond market. Again, I think that it's not as bad on the debt holders as it might appear. Yes, they hold it on their balance sheet, but a lot of that money has been used in the market for various purposes. Are they in no position, if they wanted to, to bail us out again? Yeah, they probably could. But, uh, you know, the, the main premise that some seem to miss, and it's, I forget the name of the book, one of my friends from Canada said, you got to read this, you need to read this book and come to a different conclusion, or at least think about a different conclusion, and I didn't get too far in the book, but basically the premise of the book was, you know, all this stuff has happened in the past, we had the savings and loan crisis in the 90s, and they restructured the debt, and, you know, so many shopping centers and homes that were overvalued, and this is like a repeat of what we just seen in 2007, 2008, but uh, not to the level that it happened recently, and it all write it out and the government came in made these stipulations and gathered up this debt and, and we structured it and life went on but the presupposition here is that the government can take care of it no matter what which is invalid the valid view is that governments do fail i mean if you look at the roman empire it failed and so the whole presupposition of this book was that government can take care of it no matter what happens and that's invalid that is not correct history proves it distinctly inaccurate Governments do fail. I mean, if you look at the basic truth, it's very simple. What's the government? The government is the ability to reach into your back pocket and keep itself sustained, even if they have to come in a gun and take it from you. Well, when there's nothing less left to take, the system has failed, and that's the point we're approaching. Mathematically, we've already hit a point of no return, not so much on the current net value of today the way this fictitious accounting is calculated, but if you look at what the obligations are out into the future and you do it on a normal accounting basis, there's not enough money out there to take care of what the promises are going out for the unpaid balances of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, pension plans, the military, and on and on. And on. So we're broke. And who's responsible for that? Well, most of these are government sponsored programs or direct payments or transfer payments, I should say. So you can take all of the capital base that exists and keep paying for a while and you're going to run out of money. And that's what, where we're at. That's exactly where we're at. So in a sense, mathematically, we've already failed, but we haven't recognized it in the marketplace. The markets are still acting as if either it can be overcome, we can grow our way out of it, or some other solution will come at hand. But basically, it's going to take what would happen in any bankruptcy, and that is a restructuring of the debt. And what that means is that we need to basically sit down like adults and say, this can't be paid, and here's what we're going to do. And that day is ahead of us. And whether Jim Rickards is correct, that we'll go back, or he says hope, I don't want the words in his mouth, and I don't read all the stuff, by the way, but I think he has a very well balanced and, and historical perspective. You either go back in a gold standard, maybe you don't, and hopefully you will, or some type of gold standard, you know, a gold cover clause or whatever, and you have some stability, or perhaps you don't. And if you don't, game's open. I don't think there's a Bretton Woods coming out to head this off at the pass. In other words, I don't think that there's going to be a currency reorganization on a global basis like a Bretton Woods 2 before the problem manifests at a level where it's a crisis. My take is that governments are not proactive, they're reactive. So my take from history and the way I see things going is that after there's a major crisis, either in the bond market or bond markets or a currency or whatever, then there'll be some type of Bretton Woods 2, the powers that be will sit down and there'll be some restructuring. But at that time, it may be too late, meaning that you know, there might be so much disruption on a global basis that it might be very hard to get Genie back in the bottle, so to speak. So really, to my thinking, it would be better to intervene now. You're getting massive hints. I mean, with this downgrade from China, it's sort of a slap in the face and a wake-up call. I mean, people may not like it, or maybe they do. From my perspective, it's a slap in the face to say, wake up, look what you're doing. It's time to, again, this is my version, sit down at the table globally, renegotiate what's going on with these international markets, because we all 
all are tied to each other. It is a global market. And what are we going to do to rectify this? What are we going to do to get this debt restructured where we can you know, move forward instead of pretending like, again, we can go our way out of this or we can do something about it when really the reality is you cannot, not in this current form. If the government's broke, what's next? Are the bank's going broke, or they foresee something worse coming along that they're protecting their assets for potentially? Might there be a bank run? The, the reason why I'm going down this road is there was an article posted on Infowars.com affiliated with Alex Jones, and some people take him with a grain of salt. That was reposted on the Drudge Report, one of the most well-trafficked internet websites, news resource websites in the world, and it seems it, it's true that after November 17th, one will not be able to wire money out of the country on a business account and anything more than $50,000 worth of cash transactions are not going to be allowed to occur in many business related accounts with one of the largest banks in the world. Very scary. I read the article a couple times. I did see it on Alex Jones and of course as you say it's been posted on the Drudge Report. This is basically currency control. It's your money but you can only do with it as we say. I mean this goes back to the 2000 crisis in Argentina which I urged all of my members and the public because I did it in both venues to watch the empty ATM. You can type the empty ATM into Google search engine, and I think you can watch it for free. It was a PBS public broadcasting system documentary on actual facts. So in the Argentine situation, you could have X amount of money in the bank. The bank said, we're not closing. There's no bank run. Your money is there. But here's the deal. You can only withdraw this much per week, no matter what. So as an example, you could have 25000 quote-unquote, dollars, their currency, in the bank, but you're only allowed to withdraw 200 per week. Well, let's say that your mortgage payment's 1000 a month, so the most you can get out is 800 How are you going to make that $1,000 payment? How are you going to buy food and utilities and make your mortgage payment? It can't be done. So this is a very similar situation. They're not saying that the money in your account isn't there. What they're saying is the money in your account is totally under our control up to a limit of 50000 and that's all you can have. Oh, this is absolute total Orwellian nightmare manifest in the reality. It's your money, quote unquote, I put quotes around your, because it's under their control. It's like your dad and you're a teenager saying your savings account is X amount, but I own it, and he, you get $20 a week allowance. That's it. Doesn't that pretty much kind of kill free enterprise, David? <laughs> well, the repercussions are unknown, but I agree with you. I mean, if you think it through, what does this really, really mean? And I mean, I could give you 10 scenarios, and you could give me 10, and it's probably going to come out differently, but certainly it's, it's stifling to what it will do in the marketplace, and it's a scary thing. And then to pre-announce it like this, most of the time, in my opinion, when these type of things take place, they're done on what I call a trial balloon basis, meaning these signals are given in the marketplace, and then the powers that be, the city banks at all, come back and look and see what the market's reaction to it will be. And based on that, then they make an adjustment if necessary. So I'm not getting totally worked up over at the current time. It is in the future. It's November 17th, but I'm definitely watching the markets closely to see what the reaction will be, as I think they are as well. So whatever actually happens on November 17th or thereabouts may not be as severe as what is being laid out for us to sort of taste right now. Well, you can rest assured that the real powerful elite will have exemptions. I mean, there will be certain corporations that can do any amount that they want, and probably some very wealthy individuals can do whatever they want. But for the peon class, for the 99%, this will hold. I mean, this is, again, theoretical because it hasn't been implemented, and we're not at that date. But nonetheless, it'll be interesting to see how this manifests and what happens between now and then. Well, I don't know where to go with this. I think we could, as you mentioned, lay out 10 different scenarios and talk about this for another half an hour so let's just leave it be and take a look at how the markets are reacting today and by the markets I mean the metals markets to the news we've had that everything seems to be okay for a little while uh, that means that uh, money will continue to be pumped into the system and the debt ceiling has been raised and gold and silver are up and that brings us to the uh, silver summit should it be a good one well, the Silver Summit it should be a good one. I mean, it's trying times for metals investors. It has been the last two years. No one makes light of that topic. But I think there's going to be a great debate going.
going on between Jeff Christian and Bill Murphy. We, the Silver Summit, have invited Jeff, who's, from my perspective, more an establishment perspective, and Bill Murphy, one of the most outspoken entities out there, you know, GATA, on gold manipulation, silver manipulation as well. So I think it'll be very, very not only entertaining, but perhaps enlightening for the audience. Hopefully it'll be filmed and available on YouTube or something like that, because I'm sure that there's a vast audience out there in the worldwide, really, that would like to see point counterpoint, so to speak. So I think that's a big draw for people that want to see it live. And of course, there's the mining companies, and there'll be other speakers talking about all things silver, but that's much bigger than that. I mean, basically, the Eric's brought lectures the last couple of years have been basically about what we just talked about, the banking crisis. Why would you keep money in a bank? Banks are not safe. They're not sound. A Greek situation could happen, and on and on, you know, referring to the bail-ins. It's a venue that covers the economy. It covers gold. It covers silver. It covers other resources. But the primary focus is, is primarily silver, and the gamut is covered. I mean, you've got the very conservative or, again, establishment type of views, as well as some of the more arcane, such as Bix Weir and his Ro Deruta theory, which is quite an interesting perspective on the markets. And I try to stay open-minded on all of it. Certainly, I don't have all the answers. As I get older, probably more questions than answers. But nonetheless, it is a very unique show. It's one of a kind. It's developed that way, and it's one that's very happy to participate in. It's really fascinating, this whole government banking crisis is just boosting something you've said all along, the case for accumulating physical silver and gold. And one of my friends who just happens to be pretty savvy as, as an individual investor, private investor, it's not what she does for a living, but she's been successfully shorting and reaccumulating silver. She's done very well during these last few weeks. Well, I've been in the silver market for you know, 40 years or so. And the reason that I started this advanced service so many years ago is because knowing the volatility of the metals, and particularly silver, from my view, you're really going against it if you buy and hold only, especially on the shares. In other words, it behooves you to try and trade part of your position, and that's what I do. But some people aren't bent for that, and the best thing for them to do is take a very long-term perspective and dollar-cost average. But for those that can time the market with some accuracy, and none of us are perfect at it, I've made more good calls than bad, but never been perfect, and no one is, you can definitely take advantage of some of these swings. And psychologically, it's beneficial to your mindset because it's like, okay, this market is overbought. You know, I can sell the paper back to them. I call beating the bankers at their own game. And you can take those paper profits and recycle them into physical metal. Well, I've done that several times on the way up. So it hasn't been that easy on the way down. And I did call the top at 48. I know I've said that probably too many times. And basically bought puts or urged many of our members to do that. My big mistake was to not roll those things over again and again and again and keep that hedge on two or three years out, which is probably would have been, looking in hindsight, the best thing I could have done. I only kept them on for several months, but certainly not years, which is, again, what should have taken place or could have taken place. It would have been more beneficial. We'll be right back. The Ellis Martin Report is sponsored by Xterra Incorporated, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol XAG.V. Xterra is a Toronto-based resource company, and their primary project is the Bilbao Silver Zinc Lead Copper Deposit, situated in the Panfio Natera district of Zacatecas, Mexico, approximately 50 kilometers south of the state capital of Zacatecas, where Xterra is currently completing a bankable feasibility study. Between the company's Bilbao, Laguna, and Panfio projects, Xterra has a resource of 100 million silver equivalent ounces, including 33 million ounces silver in 43101 compliant resource. Zacatecas is a well-known mining district with infrastructure in place. Mining opportunities are both open pit and underground. There are no significant environmental issues and there is an available local workforce there as well as goods and services for development of the projects. You can find a full investor prospectus on Xterra's website. Just log on to xterra.ca or find their logo and click through on the homepage of our website, ellismartreport.com. And we're back. To follow you and subscribe to everything that you're paying attention to, at least publicly, we can do so through Twitter, through YouTube, and of course, subscribe to your service on themorganreport.com. Yes. The easiest thing to do is just go to the website, silver-investor.com, and get on our free email list. When you do that, you get a 30-day free trial to the members-only portion of the website. There's too much to talk about. Once you're in, you can see for yourself all the special reports, the mining reports, the Morgan report itself, the video. 
videos, some of the trades we've made, and on and on. And again, that's free for 30 days. So I recommend anyone that's interested in these markets have a free look. We'll leave it at that. David, thanks so much for joining us today. A great discussion this morning. Thank you. I've been speaking with analyst and newsletter writer David Morgan. His website is themorganreport.com. Listen to the segment again on the podcast page of our website, ellismartreport.com. The preceding segment has been sponsored by Xchair Incorporated, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol XAG.V. Xchair plans to become a mid-tier producer of silver and base metals through the development of its Bilbao deposit located in the central Mexican mineral belt in the state of Zacatecas, as well as through additional exploration and acquisition opportunities. Find Xchair on the web at xchair.ca.